Joining me on the programme, Princess Diana's former private secretary, Patrick Jefferson. Thank you so much for coming in. Great to see you. I mean, I wonder whether you think Omid Scobie there, who appears to be very much the mouthpiece of, of Prince Harry and Meghan, is the Andrew Morton de nos jours. We remember Andrew Morton pretty much doing the same thing for the late Princess Diana. Yeah, I think Andrew Morton is a historian of a, of a superior calibre, let me put it that way. Uh, it's interesting, the coronation... You know, it's been planned down to the last detail. Mm -hmm. It's been rehearsed up and down. No surprises. Everybody knows what's happening. But the Harry factor is the drama factor. Nobody knows. I don't think they know exactly what's going to happen. And even if they think they know, who knows if it's going to run to script? Well, they know, I'm quite sure, where they think they're going to place him, don't they? Where he is in the plus more, you know, how many rows back he's going to be, whether he's going to be enshrined in the bosoms of Beatrice and Eugenie, who'll be looking after him and smiling and chatting with him, or whether he'll be stuck under the rafters with some ancient bishop or something. I mean, they know where they're putting him, don't they? So that's not a surprise. He won't do anything disruptive, so that won't be a surprise. And then he's going to whisk himself out of view and straight back to Archie's birthday party, and that's not a surprise. What may be a surprise is what people make of it, though. Mm -hmm. The overall issue of, you know, the king appears not to be able to control his, his, uh, his son. And the, the whole question of whether uh, Harry, by turning up, is showing uh, loyalty to his father, of course, you know, there, there's a strong family bond, but he has done a lot of damage to that for reasons that he no doubt thinks are justified. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you remember Harry well as a child? I mean, you used to see him virtually every day, didn't you? I did, yes. And, and, and you know, lots has been written about what kind of a mother the late Princess Diana was, and many things have been said about her being very loving and very, very kind, of her wanting to make up to Harry for any feeling he may have had of being a spare. Um, apparently, she used to call him Good King Harry, but 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 it's also been suggested that she was maybe overly lenient, maybe too indulgent, and maybe, you know, I don't know, was a little lax when it came to the discipline. What did you see? Ah, she was actually quite a strong disciplinarian. Ah. She was very, very keen that both William and Harry understood how important it was, if you're royal, if you have all these privileges, uh, that you show you understand that you're privileged and you are extra nice to ordinary people. You know, she would take them to McDonald's or the movies or even Disney World. Mm -hmm. Not so that they could be normal, but so they could understand what ordinary people's lives were like. And I think that, that Harry and William, for that matter, have taken that to heart. They do understand what ordinary people's lives are like as far as they're ever going to. And, and yet, you know, that there is, I think many people will agree, a, a dissonance in the constant kind of plangent complaining of Harry and also Meghan. Um, you know, all the things that have been done unto them, all the things that have not been given to them, all the things that, in, you know, in every way have slighted them, while everybody else is trying to endure this horrible cost of living crisis and doing their best to decide between heating and eating. And, and that, would, that would seem to imply that he doesn't have a very strong grasp on what real people's lives are really like. Well, he has moved to the centre of the victim culture. What's interesting in reading uh, Spare, his book, a lot of it is very well done and a lot of it is, is easy connect, to connect with. And a lot of it I recognised from, from my own experience. But the, uh, it's a cultural problem now. It's Windsor versus California. And th those are two very difficult cultures to, to try and so line up. So when you say you recognised it from your own experience, that means, you know, seeing uh, Diana and her sons all the time, does it mean that you feel that you're, you're, you feel a great deal of compassion for Harry? That you feel that he, you know, has had a rough ride and that he hasn't been understood and appreciated, and most particularly wasn't really uh, ably supported after he lost his mother at such a young age. He writes particularly well about the loss of his mother. It's something I can I can relate to slightly, and I think uh, if you look at his his own sense of duty, you look at his military service. Uh, he is often accused of not being terribly clever. Mm. Well, I mean, uh, great intelligence is not a feature of, of our royal family, generally. But I think he, by his own measure, is an honest person. And a lot of, of uh, his, his mistakes, I think, are through not knowing when to be quiet, when to listen, when to bide his time and think more carefully about what he says. But you can't necessarily blame him for having things to say. 
No. But what about the way in which he said them? What about the publicity? What about the, you know, the, the, the comments that he's made about people who haven't been asked permission first? You know, various things in that book that could have been left out. Oh, yeah. I mean, it has been an extraordinarily effective way of, of gaining publicity and profile. And that, that equals book sales. Uh, but it is, it is also, I think, worth sparing a thought for, for Harry and the solitary row he feels he has had a hoe for himself. And if there is a, you know, if there is a just um, opinion of what's happened between him and his family, I think you have to look for a little bit of fault on both sides. I mean, one of the things that I think people were maybe somewhat surprised by in Spare was his assessment of Camilla, formerly Camilla Parker Bowles, now about to be queen. Um, he talks about her effectively being scheming, strategic, you know, having her eye on effectively the main chance, you know, that kind of a thing. And I think before that, people had thought that relations between William, Harry and Camilla were amicable and amiable and somehow congenial in the way that very, very, very posh people seem to manage to do that despite all kinds of feelings of jealousy and upset that normal people would be subject to. We never quite work out how they do it, but they seem to do it in the same way that, you know, Camilla is going to have her ex-husband at the coronation. Andrew Parker Bowles will be there smiling broadly, no doubt. And that's not how most people live their lives, is it? But that's what's interesting about, about uh, Harry's references in, in Spare, because you have the, uh, the official line, oh, yes, everything's fine. And then you have Harry, presumably, alone with his, with his uh, ghostwriter, and the ghostwriter says, come on, Harry, tell me what it's really like. And Harry gives it to him, both mm -hmm. barrels. Mm -hmm. And um, it is true, I think, that this is not necessarily a reflection on Camilla herself, but the way in which the palace had to adapt, for example, media relations in order to reinvent her, that certainly does reward some more careful analysis. And I think Harry, not particularly effectively, but he is pointing a finger at something that maybe needs to be explored more. I know, but I think it's too late for that. I mean, you know, people, there was a kind of bristling of indignation against Camilla. People knew her route to, you know, Charles's heart. They didn't like it. They didn't approve of it. And many, many people felt that um, the very young Diana Spencer, Lady Diana Spencer, was a kind of sacrificial lamb and they, they, they used her quite ruthlessly. However, many years have now gone by. And as you say, there's been a hell of a lot of ingenuity and effort expended on rebranding. And it's worked an absolute treat. People keep on saying now how thrilled they are that Camilla will be queen, what a great queen she's going to be, how happy she's made the king, how much easier she makes dealing with the king, what a thoroughly decent down-to-earth sort of person she is, and all that stuff. Some of the polls obviously haven't heard that message and have a bit of catching up to do. Just uh, last week, I think it's 86% of people in a male poll said that they didn't approve of Camilla, Camilla being called queen. Times poll, 90% of people. So there are, there, there are two voices here. Mm -hmm. There's the official voice of Buckingham Palace, which says, haven't we done a great job? And then there is the, the very quiet, sometimes silent uh, <laughs> sense that, that something has been uh, played here in a not entirely royal way. Tell me about what you consider to be the world view on the coronation, how it's being perceived across the pond and throughout Europe and beyond. It'll be great TV, no doubt about it. Fantastic TV, and you know we Brits are proud of saying we we do this better than anybody else. I'm not sure that's necessarily true, but we do it in our own way. If we don't, who does it better than us? Uh, it depends what sort of thing you want, um, but there is a there is a human quality to British pomp and circumstance, which is rather appealing, I mm -hmm. think, to the rest of the world. I don't think that many people in the rest of the world think, oh gosh, I wish we had a king and a queen too. They're usually pretty happy with their own. Uh, set up, but there is a, a definite feeling that this is a, a connecting with a part of history. That's especially valuable, I think, for a lot of American viewers. Here they are connecting at great distance to part of their own history. And that's always fascinating. People will like to share moments of history. Patrick Jefferson, always a pleasure. Thank you very much for coming in.